Trinity Baptist Church, we're going to be singing praise to God this morning and especially think about God as, as he's identified in 1 Samuel as the Lord of hosts. So he's the one that uh, commands our allegiance, uh, but most importantly is the one that commands us, uh, commands our faith and our trust in him. We're going to sing initially how great he is, and then as we go through it, we're going to sing how he, what he does for us and, uh, and how the battles in our lives and in history uh, belong to him. We're going to invite you to stand to sing as we open uh, in invocation, which is uh, great is the Lord. supposed to be one of the last few days before the cold hits again? Well, we're tough. We can handle it, I'm sure. We are very happy to have you here in the sanctuary and you joining us online. And we thank you for coming and we uh, certainly are hoping that the Lord would be blessed and give and that we would give him the glory this morning. Just before I uh, pray and uh, we'll continue with the service, there are just a couple of announcements. The first is that this evening is our annual general meeting. It's going to happen as a hybrid meeting. Now, some of you are thinking, what does that mean? That means here in our sanctuary, in our main auditorium, uh, you can come in person, and then also those who are online can join through using a Zoom link that was provided in uh, the newsletter for the last couple of weeks. So whether you are here in person or attending remotely, uh, you will have the ability to participate and listen to the uh, reports and to vote on some rather important motions uh, having to do with our church this next year and so on. So please make an effort, especially if you're a member. If you're not a member, that's fine. You can continue to join. We welcome your attendance, but votes are limited to members, okay? That's the way, that's the, way the world works, it seems. And uh, so that's what we'll be that what we'll be doing. Join with me in prayer as we uh, ask the Lord to continue to bless this morning. Heavenly Father, we do thank you. You are great. You are worthy of glory. Father, we are not great. We are not worthy of glory. We're actually quite frail and fragile. But the good thing is, you know that. You know our frame. You know what we're able to take and what we can't. Lord, there are a few of our congregation that are laid low 
with sickness, some with COVID, some with other ailments. There may be many whom we know that are in hospital or suffering from some something to do with body and health. Lord, you are the great physician. You made us, you put us together. You keep us going. And I pray for those who could not be here for one reason or another. And I pray that you would bring them back to full health and strength. That's my request anyway, Lord, subject, of course, to your will. Father, we have come to worship you, to fellowship with one another, to learn more of your word. And I pray this morning that it would be your Holy Spirit that helps us to understand how to apply the truth that is said and sung and, and done to our own lives. You are the real teacher, Lord. These things I pray, and hopefully we all pray in Jesus' name, amen. going to resolve all the challenges of our life, not necessarily in the present, but also in the future. But then he's also victorious in our lives, and so we'll reflect on the fact that the battle belongs now to God. But initially, we're going to sing uh, Ira Sankey hymn. So these will be, um, so as you remember your church history, these will be songs sung at uh, the D.L. Moody revivals uh, a few years ago. And uh, the, um, and reflective of uh, of some of the excitement and the energy that's involved in, in facing our sorrows now, but also knowing that uh, there is going to be victory for us in the present, but most especially in the future. So.
Take courage, my friend, your redemption is near. The battle belongs to the Lord, and we sing glory. So our readings come from three passages today. We have Micah 6, 6 to 8, Micah 7, 18 to 20, and Psalm 40, 1 to 8. With what shall I come to the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come to him with burnt offerings, with yearling calves? Does the Lord take delight in thousands of rams, in 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I present my firstborn for my righteous acts, rebellious acts, the fault of my body for the sin of my soul? Sorry. The fruit of my body for the sins of my soul? He has told you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? 7, 18 to 20. Who is a God like you who pardons iniquity and passes over the rebellious act of the remnant of his possession? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in unchanging love. He will again have compassion on us. <clears throat> he will tread on our iniquities underfoot. Yes, you will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. You will give faithfulness to Jacob and unchanging love to Abraham, which you swore for our forefathers from the days of old. And Psalm 40, 1 to 8. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined his ear and heard my cry. He brought me up out of the pit of destruction, out of the miry clay, and he set my feet upon a rock, making my footsteps firm. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and will trust in the Lord. How blessed is a man who has made the Lord his trust and has not turned to the proud nor to those who lapse into falsehood. Many, O oh Lord my God, are wonders which you have done and your thoughts toward us. There's none to compare with you. It would be, if I would declare and speak to them, they would be just too numerous to count. Sacrifice and meal offering you have not desired. My ears you have opened. Burnt offerings and sin offerings you have not required. Then I said, Behold, I come in the scroll of the book it is written of me. I delight to do your will, O oh my God. Your law is within my heart. Amen. Thank you, Brent. Those are some passages we don't often read today but are very, are very pertinent to the passage we'll be looking at this morning. What, what do you delight in? What gives you pleasure? What do you enjoy? It's a question that has to do with one's heart and will, your body, mind, and emotions. Often what you delight in drives your decisions and actions. You desire and want, then want more or want to experience it again. Don't think that to enjoy or take pleasure is always bad. Yes, there are many pursuits of pleasure that are immoral or contrary to God's will. Not surprising. Those are usually the things the world around us endorses or encourages us to experience, you know, promising 
sinful pleasure without consequences, which is simply not true. Delight and desire can be a very good thing in the right setting. Take sexual pleasure, for example. It is intended by God to be enjoyed between husband and wife. The deceitfulness of sin says we can enjoy it outside that context. Within marriage, it is good. Outside marriage, it is sinful. Personally, I find that my sources of enjoyment change or expand over time. Yesterday, we celebrated my granddaughter's second birthday. Two years of bliss. I love all my children and their spouses, taking great delight in being with them. Having a granddaughter in the mix did nothing but heighten the enjoyment. I expect the same will be true when a second grandchild comes on the scene in a couple months. We can find pleasure in hobbies, people, adventure, nature, sports, music, lots of things, all things in moderation, but in their proper balance and context, these can be very good. Now to the title of today's message. What does God delight in? The question arises from Samuel's words to Saul, found in 1 Samuel chapter 15, and you might as well start Turning there, that's, that's where our study is going to start. Last week, we looked at portions of 1 Samuel 13 and Saul's actions after Israel launched a preemptive strike against the Philistines. He disobeyed the command of God, trusting his own judgment instead of what God had said. Consequently, Jehovah took the throne away from Saul's descendants. Sin is a problem for everyone, including Saul. We saw in both the Old Testament and New Testament that the sin problem is only solved by confessing one's sin to God and putting one's trust in him, demonstrated through obedience to his word. For the one who puts their faith in him, God is faithful to forgive and cleanse them from all sin. Saul chose another path, wanting to deal with things in his own way. This morning, we will look at a contrast between two people. I think the context presents that comparison for us. One is Saul. The other is Saul's son, Jonathan. Now, if I were to ask Jonathan Fish to come up here, now, they're not here this morning, but if I were to do that, you could draw your own comparative observations between father and son. One would be tall, the other shorter. We used to have the same hair color. One is old versus young. Both musical close genetically, thin versus thick, hair versus no hair in certain spots, athletic versus sedentary. I mean, I am more conservative and reserved. John takes after his mother in the adventuresome category. Towards the end of the message, I'll show some family photos of something John did about 14 years ago that, well, it just might relate to the comparison made in the text. Now, in order to stay within the usual time for a sermon, I won't be able to cover everything in these two chapters. Do take the time to read the entirety of 1 Samuel chapter 14 and chapter 15. If you have specific questions, and I'll tell you, the text just creates a lot of questions, feel free to ask or send me an email. I'll send the hard questions to Dr. Richard Emelson. 
He does the same thing to me in Sunday school. Hopefully you found 1 Samuel 15. The chapter opens with God sending Samuel to King Saul to deliver a divine message. Jehovah had a task for Saul to perform, to carry out a promise Jehovah made a few hundred years earlier after the Amalekites launched an aggressive, unprovoked attack against Israel in the early days of the exodus from Egypt. God wanted Saul to completely destroy Amalek. No no Amalekite and no beast of theirs was to be exempt from the slaughter. Saul gathered over 200,000 troops and traveled south to Amalek. So far, things sound quite straightforward. The mission is well understood. Saul undertakes to fulfill it as ordered. However, Saul decided to modify the mission parameters. I'll start to read chapter 15, starting at verse 7. So Saul defeated the Amalekites from Havilah as you go to Shur, which is east of Egypt. He captured Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good, and were not willing to destroy them utterly. But everything despised and worthless, that they utterly destroyed. Saul obeyed God mostly. When confronted by Samuel, Saul starts to spin the story, rationalizing what was done and sparing the Amalek king Agag and taking for themselves the best of the spoils. He blames the people for keeping the beasts, but says they did it to sacrifice to the Lord your God at Gilgal. Now, I may be reading between the lines here, but it certainly looks like Saul is trying to appease Samuel by saying these choice animals were supposed to be used as sacrifices to Jehovah. He implies that sacrificing animals more than makes up for their minor alteration of God's command. Even today, that way of thinking is not uncommon. Ever hear of someone who did wrong and gave a charitable donation to make up for it? Know of anyone who thinks they are mostly good? It's the deceptive idea that God weighs good deeds against bad deeds, finds more good than bad, and accepts them into heaven. In other words, the balance of my works are the basis upon which I am accepted. By God. Too bad the penalty for sin doesn't work that way. Good works don't cancel out the bad. Instead, we are told in Romans 6.23 that the wages of sin is death. Yes, there are varying degrees of sinfulness, but all sin has the same consequence. Death. Let me give you an example. Let's pretend we're part of a search and rescue team. We're on that helicopter flying out to Kananaskis country to rescue a mountain climber who's stranded on a ledge. So what do we do? We we clip a harness on the bottom of a rope, put it over that winch and lower it down to the climber. steps into that harness, puts it on, clips it on nice and tight, and then we winch him up, right? And all of a sudden, the rope snaps. Down he goes to his death. And you say, well, the rope was mostly good. Really? You're going to tell that to the victim's family? No, (laughs) 
mostly good isn't good enough. Being mostly obedient means you were somewhat disobedient. Even though the sin may be regarded as small, the penalty for sin is the same. To do better, to sin less, or to commit smaller sins doesn't solve anything. The real problem, or sorry, the real solution to our sin problem is to put our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, the God-man who lived a sinless life and became the perfect sacrifice for our sin. He took the penalty we deserved on himself, on our behalf, as our substitute, and provided us with his righteousness. We confess our sin to him, and he forgives us, cleansing us from all sin through the blood of Jesus. The idea that we can try harder to do enough good is not found in Scripture. Instead, we read is that by grace you have been saved through faith, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Faith or trust in him is the key. Saul doesn't show that he understood that. To him, being mostly obedient should be good enough. Samuel didn't accept any of Saul's excuses. And in chapter 15, verse 22, he says to Saul, Has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of divination, and insubordination is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. The question Samuel asked points to the issue. Has Jehovah as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of Jehovah? God gave Israel the sacrificial system and the law, and the law was good. God also expected Israel to put their trust in him and show that faith through their obedience to what he commanded. Obedience was good. Now, given that both obedience and sacrifice are good, which one delights God? Which one gives him pleasure? Earlier in the service, Brent read from Psalm 40. Let me read three of those verses. Psalm 40, I'll start to read at verse 6. Sacrifice and meal offering you have not desired. My ears you have opened. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. Then I said, Behold, I come in the scroll of the book. It is written of me. I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. Let me get this straight. For someone to do your will or to obey him is actually delightful. In fact, Samuel implied that it delights God as well. To obey is better than sacrifice. Now, some of you might still be paying attention and wondering if I've contradicted myself. You said faith, not works, was essential. And now you're saying that works is also essential? In the New Testament, James tells us that true faith and trust in God produces good works or obedience to him. Believing in God is not just an intellectual exercise. 
That belief is appropriated into our will and heart. That's why David wrote in Psalm 40, verse 8, Your law is within my heart. That's what believing in or putting faith and trust in God means. In his epistle to the Hebrews, the author describes this kind of faith. Hebrews 11, verses 5 and 6. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death, and he was not found because God took him up. For he obtained the witness that before his being taken up, he was pleasing to God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. Again, we see that this kind of faith is pleasing to God. It delights him. Enoch walked with God. What he did and how he lived demonstrated his faith in God, and he was pleasing to God. In fact, we're told that without this kind of faith, it is impossible to please him. Saul didn't demonstrate faith in obeying God. Now Saul's sinful disobedience cost him God's support in his kingship role. We'll see in the next chapter, chapter 16, that God instructs Samuel to anoint David as Israel's next king. Moving forward, Saul will be increasingly paranoid, suspicious of anyone he thinks might threaten his position. In 1 Samuel 13, verse 14, Samuel told Saul that God has sought out for himself a man after his own heart. It was only a matter of time. So that was Saul. What about his son, Jonathan? Last week we read in 1 Samuel 13 that Jonathan led the first attack on the Philistines, destroying their garrison at Geba. While his dad was under the pomegranate tree in their hometown of Gibeah, probably planning battle tactics with his commanders, Jonathan went out to the front line. There's, there is a canyon or wadi that separated Israel's forces from the Philistines. Jonathan was a prince of Israel, the king's son. He commanded a third of the army regulars. Now he's standing on the edge of the battlefront with only one man, his armor bearer. They observe the enemy's chariots, Horsemen and infantrymen are numerous as sand on the seashore. What would cross your mind at that point? Wow, that's a lot of enemy over there. We're heavily outnumbered and outmatched. How in the world is Dad going to win this battle? You know, perhaps to our surprise, that's not what Jonathan says. 1 Samuel 14, and I'll read verse 6. Then Jonathan said to the young man who was carrying his armor, Come, let us go over across to the garrison of these uncircumcised. Perhaps the Lord will work for us. For the Lord is not restrained to save by many or by few. Let me paraphrase. Let's go over there and knock some heads together. Well, if you're a fan of Marvel's Fantastic Four, you'll recognize this line. It's clobbering time. Well, wait a sec. John has, Jonathan has only one guy with him, but suggests they both go across to the other side and start fighting thousands of Philistines. What's the chance of success in that? There's something Jesus said in Matthew's gospel. In fact, a number of gospels record this. With people, this is impossible. But with God, all things 
are possible. You see, Jonathan understood that the outcome of any battle is decided by God, and God can defeat any foe, no matter the odds, no matter how many people you have. Jonathan is willing to do what God wants, even if the situation seems impossible and his own life is at stake. You know what that's called? Faith. It's the kind of faith the writer of the epistle to the Hebrews points to, using examples of people described in the Old Testament who demonstrated through obedience what they believed. Take Hebrews 11, verse 8, for example. By faith Abraham, when he was called out, obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for inheritance, and he went out (laughs) not knowing where he was going. You may say, oh, what a fool. God told him to go, and he went. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Jonathan had no army accompanying him, but he did have faith in God and what God had said in his word. He knew God wanted the Philistines out of Israel, Perhaps he remembered what God said in the law as Israel entered the promised land. I'll read from Deuteronomy chapter 7, some selected verses. Deuteronomy 7, verse 12. Then it shall come about, because you listen to these judgments and keep and do them, that the Lord your God will keep with you his covenant and his loving kindness, which he swore to your forefathers. Verse 17, if you should say in your heart, these nations are greater than I, how can I dispossess them? You shall not be afraid of them. You shall well remember what the Lord your God did to Pharaoh and to all Egypt. Verse 21, you shall not dread them, for the Lord your God is in your midst, a great and awesome God. Verse 23, but the Lord your God will deliver them before you and will throw them into a great confusion until they are destroyed. He will deliver their kings into your hand so that you will make their name perish from under heaven. No man will be able to stand before you until you have destroyed them. Jonathan didn't know if God was going to use his efforts that day to accomplish a victory, but he was willing to try and see. He put his life on the line, took the risk of trusting God, and asked his companion if he wanted to join him. Now, if you were Jonathan's armor bearer, what would you say? Are you nuts? (laughs) No way! Well, the armor bearer also demonstrated true faith. I think in both God and Jonathan. Verse 7 of 1 Samuel chapter 14. His armor bearer said to him, Do all that is in your heart. Turn yourself and here I am with you according to your heart. Wow. Wow. Here's the outcome of their faith. 1 Samuel 14, I'll read from verse 13. Then Jonathan climbed up on his hands and feet with his armor bearer behind him, and they fell before Jonathan and his armor bearer, put some to death after him. That first slaughter which Jonathan and his armor bearer made was about 20 men within about half a furrow in an acre of land. It's about the same size as our parking lot. Can you imagine that? And there was a trembling in the camp, in the field, and among all the people. Even the garrison and the raiders trembled, and the earth quaked so that it became a great trembling. Drop down to verse 20. And Saul and all the people who were with him rallied and came to the battle. And behold, every man's sword was against his fellow. And there was very great confusion. 
that same word confusion was promised by God in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 23, against Israel's enemies. And God delivered. When Saul saw what was happening, he and his men joined the battle. Even those who had collaborated with the Philistines began to turn on them. All the men who had gone into hiding came out and joined the conflict. In the end, was it Jonathan's victory? No. The victory belonged to God. But Jonathan's faithfulness to Jehovah and God's faithful response proved to be the rallying point for his father Saul and their countrymen. Let me ask you a question. Is it important that we please God? The Apostle Paul, in writing to the believers in Thessalonica, put it this way. I'll read 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, starting at verse 1. Finally then, brethren, we request and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us instruction as to how you ought to walk and please God, just as you actually do walk, that you excel still more. For you know what commandments we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. That is, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God, and that no man transgress and defraud his brother in the matter, because the Lord is the avenger in all these things, just as we also told you before and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us for the purpose of impurity, but in sanctification. So he who rejects this is not rejecting man, but the God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. Now as to the love of the brethren, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. For indeed you do practice it among, you do practice it toward all the brethren, who are in Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, to excel still more and to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life and attend to your own business and work with your hands, just as we commanded you, so that you will behave properly toward outsiders and not be in any need. How ought we to walk and please God? By doing what he says, as found in his word. Obedience through faith is the answer. Now there may be a cost to doing that. It might mean putting yourself at risk and stepping out by faith and not by sight. It might mean doing something you've never done before making you nervous or uncomfortable. L let's face it. Remaining sexually pure means saying no in a moment of shared passion. Paying your taxes or fairly repaying a lender or giving up your freedom for someone else may also cause discomfort. By doing what pleases God, you may end up Losing a friend, a lover, a job, a sale, an opportunity, your wealth, your security, your plans, or even your life. I promised some family photos. About 14 years ago, while on vacation in Ecuador, our family hiked on a path through the jungle along a section of the Mindo River. We came to a spot where the river narrowed between two steep stone cliffs on either side. My guess is maybe it was six feet across, not very much. 
a young man ahead of us jumped off the cliff and into the water below. That's when someone in our group decided to do the same thing. That's down. And kids were riding the rapids off the waterfall. ways down. We were figuring it's probably what? What do we think? How many meters? Ten, Ten meters? Yeah. Oh, oh, man. Yeah, the guy on the left just did it. And my son John is going, hey, that looks fun. I'll try it. Really? <laughs> He's asked how to do it and there he is. Not sure. Getting the courage up. Just walk, don't jump, because if you jump, you'll hit the rocks. Oh, man. You know what I was thinking before as I'm filming this? How am I going to carry his body out of this valley? <laughs> now, there's a little strip of pink midair. That's John. <laughs> It's a proud mama, I'll tell you that. Well, he's got abs. Mine are buried. <laughs> now, John didn't walk off that cliff to prove his faith in God. He did it for the thrill of trying something new, making a memory none of us would forget. <laughs> Indeed, I remembered it this week after thinking about Saul's Jonathan who faced another steep canyon wall. Let me ask you, would you be willing to walk off the cliff for God? You may say you believe in God, but do you believe God? Do you trust him to the point of obeying what he says? I hope so. I hope I do as well. I mean, let's face it. Our record of obedience is spotty. And we need to confess our disobedience regularly. But he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen? Step out for God in faith according to his word. And he will be delighted. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I'm glad you haven't asked all of us to step off that cliff on the Mendo River. But still, you've asked us to do things in your word that we're still not comfortable doing. Lord, forgive us for not demonstrating our faith in obedience. Help us through your Holy Spirit. Give us that encouragement, that wherewithal, that facilitation to do as you've instructed us, to say no to sin and say yes to you. That isn't just an initial conversion thing. That's an ongoing thing. At least it is for me. Father, I pray for myself. I pray for everyone here listening to these words that we would be more like Jonathan to trust you with all our heart and that we would gain our delight in doing your will just as David wrote in Psalm 40. Keep us in mind of these things throughout the week, Lord. May your spirit continually bring these things to our remembrance. And may we be changed people. <coughs> changed. Because we listened 
and heeded your word. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll invite you to stand as we sing the hymn of commitment, which is Faith is the Victory. For our benediction today, I'll read what Samuel said to the people of Israel in Gilgal out of 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 24. Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart. For consider what great things he has done for you. Heavenly Father, dismiss us with your blessing. May we go out changed people. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please don't forget the AGM tonight. We'll see you later. Bye-bye.